CCP public meeting. Um, we are so excited to have you all here this evening um, and to talk through our long-term control plan program and a lot of other things that the agency is taking on. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mikkel Adkins. I work in DEP's Bureau of Public Affairs, um, and I'm joined by several members of DEP's senior leadership team. So tonight we have Vinny Sapienza, the DEP commissioner. We're also joined by Cam Alardo, our deputy commissioner for the Bureau of Wastewater Treatment. Um, Jim Muller, our agency chief engineer, along with Keith Mahoney, who is our senior director for the office of the agency chief engineer. We also have Angela Lapata, our Deputy Commissioner for the Bureau of Sustainability, Pinar Balsi, our Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Environmental Planning and Analysis, or PIPA. Um, and we're really pleased to welcome Anna Barrio, who is our new Deputy Commissioner for um, the Bureau of Engineering, Design, and Construction. So Anna actually joined us this summer from the Department of Design and Construction, DDC. This is actually her first LTCP public meeting, so we're very pleased to have her here and really excited um, to have her expertise as many of the projects that we'll be talking about tonight are just beginning to move into the planning and design stages. Um, this evening we're also joined by several members of DEP staff who are sort of scattered throughout the audience. Um, we really want to thank them for not only all of their hard work for preparing for this evening, but for attending tonight. Um, and lastly, I do want to recognize our friends from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, DEC. We want to welcome Ed Hampston, um, who recently joined DEC as the Section Chief for Downstate Compliance. Um, over the years, many of you may have been familiar with Gary Klein, who we worked closely with from DEC. He actually retired earlier this year, um, so now we're working closely with Ed, along with Linda um, and Dom. So we have a lot of folks here this evening. We have a very packed agenda, um, but we're really hoping that we've curated a meeting that will provide a lot of information um, and provide opportunities for questions. Um, so in terms of the agenda tonight, you can see that we're covering quite a few topics this evening. Um, tonight is going to be a little bit different from last year, for those of you who attended last year, rather than holding all of the questions to the end, we're going to take breaks between each of the different speakers, take between three or four questions, so that you can really get information specifically about that topic, um, and then we'll close out with a few questions at the very end. Um, essentially, we'll be covering the LTCP program and a variety of other topics related to improving water quality here in New York City. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce Commissioner Sapienza to kick us off this evening. Thank you, Vinny. Thank you, Good evening, everyone. Uh, a lot of familiar faces, some new faces, so thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm just really going to give a five-minute overview to tee up the, the technical portion um, of the program. Just talk about some of the, the successes, I think, so far, and obviously a lot of the challenges going forward. So just a, first a little bit of a background. Who, who is DEP? What do we do? For those of you who, who are not familiar, um, our primary function is to serve as the city's water and sewer utility. So we provide New Yorkers with about a billion gallons a day of, of clean drinking water. Um, we, we manage upstate reservoirs and, and a 2,000 square mile watershed. Uh, once that water comes into the city and is used, uh, it goes into the sewer system. It's conveyed to one of 14 wastewater treatment plants. Um, and we treat about 1.3 billion gallons a day. And that includes an average daily amount of stormwater runoff. Um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. And then uh, finally, DEP is the uh, city agency that's responsible for enforcing the air, noise, and hazardous materials codes in the city. So this past year, it's about six months ago now, we came out with a strategic plan uh, for DEP and gave it a great name, Enriching Our Legacy, and, and why, did we, why did we call it that? Well, you know, we look back over seven generations of only amazing engineering work that, that's been done, uh, both here in the city and in our upstate watershed, to build the amazing infrastructure that we have that provides that, that great drinking water and is starting now to really make good improvements in harbor water quality. So, 
you know, we want to look back and, and remember all of the great work that, that those folks did and, and make sure that we continue to, to maintain those assets so that they serve us into the future. But we want to enrich that legacy because we want to do our own great engineering uh, now. And part of that, a big part of that, is the CSO program. Um, part of the strategic plan, we also came out with a mission statement. And it's just really a slight modification to, to our prior one before we had protect the environment, but we really want to enrich the environment. Uh, we want to make things even better than uh, you know they have been in, in anyone's lifetime, certainly in this room anyway. Uh, and then we have the vision is to be a world-class water and wastewater utility while building a sustainable future for all New Yorkers. Uh, things aren't static, things are changing, and we want to make sure that we're prepared uh, for those things, whether it's you know climate change or expectations of our consumers. Um, so, so that's our vision. So, you know, we, we always like to show this slide. I'm sure some of you have seen this many times, but uh, just a, a reflection back on, on the improvements that we have made in local harbor water quality. So, this is just fecal coliform concentration, summer geometric means, and, and you look back uh, a generation ago, 1985, and um, we were still discharging a lot of raw sewage, and as you can see, uh, you know, the Hudson River, parts of the East River. We're, we're really just mere open sewers at that point. Um, but the upgrades that were made to wastewater treatment plants, improvements in CSO capture, we went from 20% capture to 80% capture, has done a great job. Uh, but you know, obviously there's still a lot of work to do. You know, we have a lot of waterways, Newtown Creek, Kiwanis, uh, Flushing Bay Creek, uh, Bronx River Hutch, Coney Island Creek, and, and of course uh, the trips in Jamaica Bay. So, I think that's the, going to be the focus uh, of what we talk about today. So we talk about our 10-year capital plan. So DEP does a lot of construction, and this is what the plan looks like. So I, I, I well, just lump these three slices together because that's the, the typical water main and sewer work that we, we do. We have 7,000 miles of water mains in the city, 7,500 miles of sewers. We have to continually keep, uh, you know, as part of state of repair, replacing them as they age. We try to do it on a 100-year cycle. Uh, so we have about $5.5 billion uh, in the 10-year capital plan just for that regular work. And I'm looking in the Southeast Queens work because there are actually some parts of the city that don't even have a really modern sewer system yet. Uh, and so we've got a lot of work going on in Southeast Queens. Uh, state of good repair is primarily to keep our assets working uh, in, in good operating order. A lot of that is our wastewater treatment plants. Uh, our, our wastewater treatment plants actually got a lot of money in the 1970s after the Clean Water Act. We got a lot of federal and state money to, to do upgrades and modernize those, those facilities. But you know, we're getting on 40 years old now at those, those plants, and we're going to have to now, we're no more federal funding and very little state funding, we're going to have to pay for those, those, those upgrades. Uh, dependability is primarily on the water supply side upstate. Uh, making repairs on, on aqueduct dams, um, and, and we actually were building a lot. A big part of that is the Kent Scalise Street connection to give us redundancy uh, between the uh, UV plant and the Kent Scalise Reservoir. And then finally, mandates. Those are all the state and federal requirements, including the CSO program um, that we're required to do. And it's always a balance. So, you know, we have the $18 billion program, uh, essentially all funded through water bills, so everybody that uses water in the city, every property owner gets a bill, pays the bill, and it's always a challenge about how much you can raise rates. Uh, water rates are triple what they were in the year 2000, so we have been aggressively raising them, but um, you know, we, we get a lot of, uh, of, of flack, and, and you know, a, lot of, a lot of people who pay water bills, a lot of homeowners uh, are on fixed incomes, uh, or working, working class, and, and it's, it's often tough. So, we think we do a pretty good job of balancing where the money goes. So again, these are just some of the things we do. State of good repair. You know, I think our, our operators, and you'll probably hear it from Pamela Arno, our operators really want more money for state of good repair to get their, their facilities in, in better operating order. Uh, resiliency is another big issue. You know, sea levels are rising. We're getting more intense storms. We want to make sure that we're prepared for that and, and making improvements so that uh, you know, our, our, our assets are in a good enough condition to weather those storms. CSOs, which, you know, we're here to talk about today, and we've got significant investments uh, in, in those programs. 
Uh, but then we add energy and climate. And we always say for every additional gallon of CSO we capture, we have to convey and treat it. That takes energy, and, and there's a cost associated to that uh, as, as far as you know, releases of carbon emissions. This energy has to come from somewhere. So we've been trying to look at a lot more renewables now, and we, we, we are investing heavily in solar. This is our, our solar array at Port Richmond on a six-acre roof. We're looking at a lot of wind and, and, and other renewables that I just suggest, certainly. So I think everybody knows what a CSO is, but as my last slide, I'll just, just quickly go through what a CSO is. About 60% of the city's uh, area is combined sewers, which means there just is one pipe in the, in the, the street. Um, newer systems, there's two pipes, one for, for sanitary flow, one for storm flow, but much of the city is just one pipe. So in dry weather, it's getting uh, just sanitary sewage from, from the buildings, from toilets and dishwashers and uh, washing machines, and that's going into uh, a sewer pipe. And it all makes its way to a wastewater treatment plant. So on a dry weather day like today, that's what the system looks like. Uh, but as it starts raining and water is running off on the streets and it's catch basins or hitting roofs and going down downspouts, that sewer starts to fill up. And in many cases, the sewers are actually big enough to, to convey about 10 times the amount of sanitary flow uh, that they normally see. That, that water, that combined water, a lot of it gets to the wastewater treatment plant. It continues to follow the, the, the same flow as here to the wastewater treatment plant. But at a certain point, a certain size storm, uh, and, it, and it depends upon the area and how it's configured, certain size storm, there, there can be overflows, there are overflows uh, into local waterways, and that's combined sewer overflows. And, so that's the intent of the program is that how we can either get more flow to the wastewater treatment plants or retain the flow that's in this pipe somehow before it overflows um, and, and, and then convey it to the plant later. Or uh, an even better alternative, which we're gonna, you're going to hear about the green infrastructure program, is to prevent that stormwater from getting in the catch basin or from the roof drains into the pipe at all. Can we use natural... Uh, features to soak up that, that, that runoff. So that's it for me, and now I am going to introduce uh, the, the, the first part of the technical program. Um, Pam Lardo, who's our Deputy Commissioner for our Bureau of Wastewater Treatment, and Jim Muller, our Agency Chief Engineer, will uh, get into the meat of it. So thank you, everyone. I'm here to talk about our uh, existing infrastructure and about what we've done around it for CSO control and uh, how it's relative to the conversation tonight. So first of all, uh, we're changing from being called wastewater treatment plants to wastewater resource recovery facilities, as many uh, people in the wastewater utilities throughout the country are recognizing that we really are organizations that try to reclaim resources from wastewater. Uh, that means energy production, uh, you, many of you are familiar with the, our use of our digester gas to create energy and electricity or heat and using gas directly in the grid in a number of projects like that, biosolids, fertilizer, and also uh, you know, clean water is a product we make as well. So we really are trying to recover uh, resources from wastewater. And this depicts our system. Um, we've got 14 wastewater resource recovery facilities. We're, we're changing from WWDPs to WRRFs, so stay tuned for all that, uh, that change. Um, within that, we centralize some of the dewatering, uh, which uh, creates the biosolids products. Uh, so we have six facilities. We have CSL treatment facilities that have been built a um, long time ago, some of them. Uh, we have a huge collection system with 96 pumping stations, uh, miles of intercepting sewers. That's all fed by 7,500 miles of sewers that are in the smaller collection systems on streets uh, that go to people's homes and, and apartment buildings. We have laboratories uh, and uh, harbor vessels for sampling and, and uh, checking the water quality throughout uh, all the water bodies in the, in the area. Sludge vessels transfer sludge from non-dewatering facilities to dewatering facilities. Uh, and we have a biosolids barge, good to have, just in case and about 1,800 staff. And one of the things that, that our commissioner pointed out is much of the infrastructure we have was built a long time ago, and it is aging. And one of the other things I heard our commissioner uh, answer a question once that said, someone asked him, uh, what's the next thing for wastewater? What's the next thing you really need to do? And I think uh, the expectation was 
you know, long-term stroke plans and resource recovery. And what he said was secondary treatment, which I thought was brilliant, because that speaks to the need for us to maintain the existing infrastructure. And that is a big challenge and a big part of the budget that you saw, and justifiably so, because if we can't get the flow to the plants and we can't treat it, um, I don't know why we'd be talking about long-term control plans. So let's, uh, let's all get excited about maintenance and respectable repair and replace cycles. Um, so the, a couple points I'm going to make is that before the LTCPs really became LTCPs, we had watershed water body facility plants that did a lot of work to control CSO overflows and to increase water quality improvement, create a better receiving water that's are responsible for some of the graphics that our commissioner showed you a minute ago. I'm not going to go through all of these, but there's, there's a, a number of these um, that include things like treatment plant expansions, optimizing the sewer conveyance and capture, uh, creating more CSO storage in facilities that we have, increasing pumping station capacity, and also uh, increasing uh, our management of uh, stormwater, like the green infrastructure program. And there'll be a lot of detail on that. Um, and I didn't want to walk through all of these projects, because anybody has a specific interest, but please talk to me at some point. And then uh, this, this was uh, completed projects. And then we have ongoing projects. And these are not in the LTCPs, but they're ongoing nonetheless, and their time frame for implementing them will overlap with much of the LTCP work, much of which has already started. So again, back to uh, controlling, mod uh, modifying our regulators so we control more floatable, floatable and retain more volume, um, expanding our treatment plants themselves to increase our treatment capacity. 26 where is an example. There's GI happening all over the city. There's some great maps we'll see in a minute. Um, and I think one of the things uh, we're trying to do is to maximize the value of our existing collection systems. There are ways to use weirs and baffles so that we can store in the systems. We have to be very cautious about not creating backups into people's homes and businesses and streets because that would be very bad. But we can find ways to optimize that system and we'll be talking about that uh, more today as well. So that's um, an exciting new world for us. And I did want to throw in a little bit of cost. Again, this is outside the LTPC, LTCP cost and it's just a, a you know, near term figure of $4.2 billion. Um, 2.7 that has been in the, the gray or the traditional infrastructure and moving a lot more into the uh, green infrastructure world. So that concludes my portion. And next, I'm going to have Jim Muller come up, who will talk about his favorite, his favorite slide <laughs> called the toolbox. Because th if you need to know anything, you need to know everything on this graph, because it explains all the options that you may have to go I, I tried to say <coughs> there should only be one slide in the presentation that should do this, but <laughs> smartly, Mikhail overruled me, as long as everybody else. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Welcome. Um, so, again, this, this is what we call the CSO Mitigation Toolbox. Uh, many of you may have seen this before, but basically the point here is we've been at this for a while. Does anybody know when our first storage facility was built? CSO storage facility? DC can't answer. Like that. <laughs> Nick, you can't answer. 1972. So Spring Creek was commissioned in 1972, started construction in the 60s. And that was the last tank we built until we started building uh, storage tanks again in the 90s. Does anybody know why we stopped? Secondary treatment. <laughs> so that's a great theme for tonight. Clean Water Act was passed in 1972. Uh, and that mandated secondary treatment. And that was the national priority, was to invest in getting dry weather flow to treatment plants and treat that at a high level uh, and not you know, worry about wet weather flows that are more sporadic. So, We've been at this for a while, and as Pam mentioned, there's a lot of tools in that toolbox, some of which don't necessarily directly address CSOs, but try to address the ecology. And that's the first row on here is water ecology and ecological uh, restoration <coughs> or enhancements, uh, things we look at. And we put about $300 million behind this, so it's very diverse. Uh, wetland and ecological restoration, dredging, right? So solids accumulated over time, they can cause odors, they can cause other problems. We'll dredge them out. We've done that uh, throughout the city. Aeration, flushing tunnels. The commissioner mentioned Gowanus. We have a, an active flushing tunnel there um, that does good work on dissolved oxygen and pathogens. Um, so that's kind of one of our first rows we look at is 
ecological. We'll also look at the, the graph uh, Commissioner showed showing the harbor in 2017, very blue. Those are what we call open waters. See those tribs, those tributaries, they're tougher. They're confined. Many of you kayak. I kayaked on the water myself. They're more confined trips. They don't flush as well with the open waters. Um, they're problematic. Uh, so we'll actually try to get flow out of there and try to send it to a treatment plant. And whatever doesn't make it to that treatment plant might overflow in open water. But water quality is generally good. So that's another level. Sewer system optimization, as Pam mentioned. We'll look at what we call weirs, right? Some people call them the bench, the regulators. Uh, we'll try to see, can we raise those weirs and get more flow to the treatment plant, capture more smaller storms. Um, we'll look at bending weirs, things like that, some innovative approaches there. Um, pumping station expansions, again, expand the pumping station and pump it out of the drainage area. CSO treatment, uh, we've expanded treatment plants. Newtown Creek is part of the secondary upgrade there, $5 billion project. Part of it was expand the wet weather capacity of the plant by 80 MGD. Uh, so that was, again, to get more CSO out of those trips and into, into treatment. Hunt Point was, um, was upgraded as well as, as a few other plants. So we spent a lot of money there. Uh, source control. Green infrastructure that uh, Deputy Commissioner Mercado will talk about in a few minutes is, is a key staple of our program. Um, I always like to plug that program back in 2012. I don't think we had any green infrastructure. And in about five years, we had 4,000 pieces of infrastructure. That's tremendous. And I, I always credit Angela and the team on that. I'm always very impressed by it. Uh, and then CSO storage, that last row probably the most expensive thing we, we can do. Um, it's local, right? We don't typically build storage tunnels that ring the city because those would cost tens of billions or hundreds of billions of dollars. More local control, so we don't go there easily. We go there if it's warranted and we try to actually get even more utility out of those as we're looking at that going forward, maybe for a resiliency benefit or sea level rise benefit as well. So we're looking at making that as useful. But that's kind of our last resort. We want to examine all the tools in our toolbox to try to maximize the system. Um, so the next slide is the cost over time. So all, that whole toolbox is real. There's, as Pam mentioned, there's a lot of projects that have been completed. There's still projects that are ongoing. But it costs money. So over time, back in the 80s, you know, as we finished our secondary treatment plant upgrades, and Red Hook went online, and North River went online, and we, we saw huge gains in water quality, we started continuing on the CSO reduction curve and our costs started going up, green line, and the volume started going down. <coughs> but it's accelerating. If you look at dollars per gallon, the gallons we're chasing now that aren't already getting to the treatment plants, much more expensive gallons to get than when we were building uh, you know, those, the treatment plants and interceptors and trying to get flow to those treatment plants. So we're, we're kind of on a, a flatter part of the curve, and we're still investing, but we're trying to do it smartly. So here's where we are in LTCP milestones. Um, we've submitted to date. We, we still owe the citywide LTCP. Um, but we've submitted nine and gotten approved by the DEC to date nine LTCPs. So we're proud of that. Uh, you know, partnered with DEC, done a lot of community outreach and partnered with the communities on those LTCPs. And there's not a one size fits all. It's that whole toolbox in effect, water body by water body. Jamaica Bay was submitted um, earlier this year and we're still walking through a comment process with the DDC uh, in terms of you know back and forth there. And then the citywide, uh, that's due, um, supposed to be due at the end of this year. We have asked for a milestone extension. I think Mikhail will talk about that in a little bit just for all the good work we're doing there. But nine are approved and we're embarking on executing projects, not, not just sitting back and saying, well, we're done. We've completed what we have to do. We're executing the projects that DEC has, has approved, many through Anna Barrio's shop, the new deputy commissioner of the EDC. Uh, throw the hat on board and, and being able to execute the next generation of this program. So the planning for the approved LTCPs, uh, you know, again, this is the, uh, the status of the cost of each one of those. No small projects in here. Um, Alley, we already built the tank at Alley, so now we're looking at disinfection there. Uh, Hutch River, looking at creating an outfall and creating disinfection there as part of a larger plan. Uh, Flushing Creek, again, looking at the confined trip and disinfection. Bronx River Powell Sewers, trying to get it out of the Bronx River and migrate that more to Hunts Point Treatment Plant. And whether and if it has to overflow from really large storms, it can overflow to the East River and not the, uh, not the Bronx River. Uh, Flushing Bay, a CSO storage tunnel was proposed and approved. Uh, again, that's where our costs start really jumping up, you know, $1.6 billion. Guam's Canal, we actually recommended um, no action under our LTCP from a water quality standpoint. 
uh, because the prior project that DEC had approved on the, as Bear mentioned, the water body watershed plans, we had great results. We had reactivated the flushing tunnel, we expanded the flushing tunnel, and we increased the size of our wastewater pumping station. Got tremendous results and actually met primary contact with dissolved oxygen and pathogens. And then Superfund came along with different endpoints on PAHs and metals. So that's kind of what drove us to further storage. Uh, it wasn't necessarily Clean Water Act driven, it was Superfund driven. And a lot of sources there, I won't get into the complicated nature of that. Newtown Creek, um, Dutch Kills, for those kayakers in the room, you know, you can kayak up Dutch Kills. I've done it, it was interesting. Uh, and we've got a project now approved by DEC for Borden Avenue Pumping Station, which is right on Dutch Kills, to expand that almost by a factor of 10 and build a force vein and send that flow right over to the treatment plant, which is right across the river, about, a, about a three quarters of a mile away. Um, so pretty cost effective project, $87 million. We're going to get about a 75% reduction of CSO to Dutch Kills, a confined trip. The harder part of Newtown is the, the further in you go. So Newtown's about two and a half miles long. The Dutch Kills is right, maybe a half a mile from the East River, closer. You keep going, there's bigger and bigger outfalls as you go further in, and it's just less and less flushing with, uh, with the East River and the open water. Again, a tunnel proposed there, it's three outfalls, each contributing about 300 million gallons a year, and it's about a $1.3 billion tunnel. Much longer time frame than the Borden Avenue pump station. Borden's within like the next 12 years. This tunnel will be much further out, uh, much further out than that, kind of a next generation type of thing. Um, bacteria attainment, you know, as, as the commissioner showed our actual data, we look very good in, in the open waters. When you start looking at the tributaries, it gets more difficult uh, for various reasons. Um, so our attainment does vary. Uh, Flushing Creek you know, in the 83 to 93 percent range, Newtown in the 83 to 93. Uh, Bronx River getting a little bit better with that interaction with the East River and, and up from there. So we're pretty proud of our percent attainments. Again, recognizing how difficult some of these water bodies are to deal with. Um, this is just kind of how, how that ends out when we look at fecal. We, we do have Intero uh, on here as a, uh, as a percentage, uh, something we're still you know, kind of working through. Right now, this, the DEC ruling uh, involves fecal that we'll measure these tributaries by, so that's the primary attainment. Uh, and we look at Intero as a sensitivity. Again, this is just more model projections on DO. This is dissolved oxygen. Um, you know, again, in the confined trips, this can be a challenge. <clears throat> so, also in 2018, the ecological-based approaches that I mentioned, wetlands restoration, uh, biofiltration through rib mussels. It's interesting, you used to talk about oysters, and part of the thing there was uh, an attractive nuisance. Like, if you have oysters filtering the water, you don't want people thinking they can eat them. So move to rib mussels, which are not an attractive nuisance. So that's why the rib mussels are credit John McLaughlin, and, and uh, uh, Angela's group on, on that. Um, nutri nutrients also is, is a, a continuing um, you know, battle for the environment. And there's some bio extraction that occurs there. Uh, Chesapeake Bay, there's some models for this, not just what we're trying to do, but Chesapeake Bay and others in the country are pursuing more you know, diverse portfolio around ways to handle water quality issues. And this is the Jamaica Bay LTCP submitted in 2018 that we're still back and forth um, you know, in terms of uh, technical comments. Um, but you know, wetland restoration, rib mussel biofiltration, green infrastructure, and environmental dredging are kind of the, the sweet spot there. We've, we've already implemented projects for CSO storage and maximizing flow of the treatment plants. Uh, those are completed. This seemed to be the next best step. And for the most part, the open waters in the bay, for the most part, look pretty good. It's again those, those tributaries that are, that are just trickier. Um, so, Michael, you want to pause to facilitate some questions? Yes. Um, Pam, can you pop up too? So um, thank you, Jim and Pam. I know that that was a lot of information for us to go through, but we do want to sort of take a quick break um, and take a couple of questions for Jim and Pam on sort of the LTCP program overview. Um, are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, what's the expected timeline for those nine projects that are just approved to go from like an approved to submitted status? So, Mitchell, I'll just flip And it goes slide 18. Yep. That one? Yeah. Yep. Go to the next one and I'll pass it. Sure. Years. So this is the, the duration in years. You can see the, the total project duration, uh, breaking it into planning and design and construction. So they're all staggered at different points. They're all approved. They were, you know, some of these were approved earlier than others, um, uh, but that's kind of how it varies. It does. Uh, there's a lot of factors that go into that siting. 
you're all familiar, you could just even, it's amazing just driving here tonight to see the development in this neighborhood. You know, a lot of that's going on citywide. Siting is an issue, you know, how we can get sites for, 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 our, uh, for our facilities. So that's one key factor. Just the size of the programs are another, and environmental reviews that are necessary and whatnot. So all that's baked in to these kind of staggered schedules. Uh, we do, you can see it's not just backloaded, and it's, you know, it's, it's throughout. And we've already, as Pam, I think, covered really well. We've already completed a lot of work to date, so this is the future, but um, this, hopefully this kind of answers your, answers your question. I think I saw another hand. Yeah, Ira? Uh, where does uh, daylighting appear in the toolbox, the reduction of CSOs by daylighting? So that's uh, under source control, and we're going to talk a little bit more about daylighting under uh, Keith's part of the program, under Keith Mahoney, where he'll talk. He's the senior director of water quality planning in, in my new office, and he'll talk about uh, under the citywide where we are looking at daylighting, and it's uh, it's certainly very effective in certain instances. It looks it looks it looks very um, positive. So we are there. You'll hear more about that. Yes, ma'am. Right. Me. Yes. Hi. I just want to say offhand that I'm just a resident in the community. I happen to represent a grassroots organization. And I do, you have to excuse me if I don't know the lingo or know what's going on as far as the technical issues. My concern is the fact that you are now proposing plans for the CSOs. And of course, the residents, common people like myself, are concerned about the amount of waste that's going. But we're also concerned about the amount of development that's happening in our communities. And we have, we're very disappointed with the elected officials and DEC and DEP because we have a very contentious development that's happening right now in Brooklyn, along the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens. And they have invaded an EAS and an EIS even though they're planning on building an additional thousand residential units. They're, we have contacted several of some of the speakers here, some of the people here in the audience, about our concern with developers lying on their applications for rezonings and thus evading EISs. And in particular, that issue has not been addressed. So I'm just here. Here you have this wonderful plan. You're talking about all this development, but who's enforcing um, the rules and regulations? Um, and who's supervising the lead agency, in this case, DCP, who's not ensuring that these applications are going through an environmental impact analysis so the community and not being one of those people in the community is aware of all the negative effects that can happen to our water and sewage and then is implementing mitigating situations to deter them or lessen them. So I, I, I've been getting everybody telling me it's somebody else's job. So I just want to know here on the record whose job it is to ensure that developers are not evading environmental impact analysis when they should be. Thank you. There, there's a lot to your to your question to unpack a bit and a, a few different things. So I sort of want to look to Angela Licata, who's our Deputy Commissioner for Sustainability. Her team is the one that works very closely with the Department of City Planning um, on environmental impact statements and assessments. So. Good evening. I'm not exactly sure which project you're speaking about. Um, I sent a letter to uh, Robert Elborn from the Regional Water Engineer. I sent a letter to Chief Ed Hampson from DEC Bureau of Water Compliance. I sent a letter to Director Mark Claus from DEC Division of Water. I sent a letter to Commissioner Vincent Sapiezo from New York City DEP. I sent a letter to Mick Agate the senior advisor for strategic planning DEP. I sent a letter to Matthew Rudman, the assistant counsel for DEP. I mean, I've sent the letters, and I've sent the documents, mm -hmm. so you guys have them. Okay. So let's get past that. Yeah, I just, I wasn't sure exactly what project it was referring to, but I can talk to you a little bit about the process um, and certainly the particulars of the individual projects, so what's important. 
Um, but the procedures are such that before you have a rezoning or a new development project in the city of New York, the very first thing that you go through is in the lead agency, which in this case for a rezoning would be the Department of City Planning. I happen to know about these procedures because for our agency, we would be the lead agency if we were proposing a project that needed discretionary approvals. So a project that would not be um, as of right in accordance with the building code would require discretionary approvals. I suspect the project that you're speaking about does require quite yes, a lot of approvals. the negative declaration already. Okay, so then in that very next stage is to go through the city's environmental quality review process. Um, and that would also trigger um, an impact analysis. So you go through all of these categories of impacts. It's not. Okay, so we, we should talk about that offline. Um, but then the next step in that process would usually be a uniform land use review um, decision making by, by the City Planning Commission. Has that happened yet? Yes, we are at the end of that process. We're at the end of the ULA process. Yes. Okay, well, we can talk to you offline about the specifics of this project, but that is the agency that would be responsible ultimately for deciding on the discretionary approvals and then if there are uh, state approvals as well um, and there could be federal approvals I i'm just not sure of the specifics um, but those would also go through individual agency reviews so it sounds as though you're not um, quite content with the um, look or the the there was no look Okay. That's so, the point. Well, we, again, I don't know the particulars, but we could take that offline. I can discuss it with you some more. I mean, what you told me is something. Excuse me, Miss. Okay. I'm sorry. We do have to move on, but we will definitely touch base with you after this meeting to figure out how we can respond better to your question. Um, so, I do just want to take one more question. Yeah, Mike. Thanks for coming. I appreciate the EP staff coming out to do this. I'm glad BBC came all the way down from Albany so that we could ask these questions. But the question I want to ask is why is DEP allergic to public participation? You had 10 LTCPs that have gone to DEC for review. Not a single one of them was provided to the public despite us asking for them over and over again so that we could review them. Our experts could understand what you're doing and we can provide comments and get responses to those comments. The work is being done, it's being done behind closed doors with the UNDEC. And so why can't we participate, especially for the citywide LTCP that's forthcoming, that you got a 15 month extension for, plenty of time to include us and to give us that document. Yeah, um, so you're jumping the gun a little bit because we do have a whole section on public participation um, a little bit further on, so spoiler alert, um, we will be talking a little bit um, about the process that we've had to date. So throughout the development of uh, those 10 LTCPs that we've submitted so far, I think we've had over 30 public meetings specific to, that, to those programs. Um, we've had additional meetings with community boards, elected officials, environmental organizations such as Riverkeeper and SWIM. Um, and I will say that we have worked to improve um, our public participation. I'm the first one to admit that we had a lot of challenges, particularly as we started out. I think for many of you who have been with us since 2012, you know that I think the first time we had a meeting like this, we had maybe 15 or 20 people in attendance, and now we get over 100 in some cases. So we really worked hard to partner with folks um, to get information to you and to get feedback. And I do know that one of the um, concerns and the issues has been the fact that earlier the public was not um, alerted to what the recommended plan would be in advance of the submission to DEC. And that was definitely a, a point of contention that we heard throughout the process. And so that's why last year we committed to sharing that recommended plan with the public before the LTCP was submitted to the state. And so as you know, we did that for Jamaica Bay. Now before you, I see your light popping on. Um, I understand that we had a different interpretation of sharing the recommended plan with you than you did. And the, many members of the public expected the opportunity to review a final LTCP before it was submitted to the state. 
As you know, given the time constraints for Jamaica Bay, we were not able to do that. Um, but as you saw, what was in the LTCP for Jamaica Bay, in terms of the recommended plan, did not differ from the materials and the presentations that we shared with you throughout that period of meetings on the recommendation. Um, and then in terms of the citywide LTCP, I'm gonna ask you to hold on to that because we really do have a whole section on public participation in 2019 for the citywide LTCP. And so we can revisit your question then. Thanks, Raquel. We Thanks. saw a 50 slide presentation for a 500 page document. So that's what we need to see the document. I understand. So let's let's circle back to it once we get to that section. Um, so with that, I'd like to say thank you to Jim and Pam, um, and actually invite Angela up to talk through affordability and green infrastructure. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. I'm going to talk a little bit about financial capacity um, of our ratepayers and our residents um, to afford the great projects that we build, um, and also to talk a little bit about the impact that um, these rates may have on certain sectors of the population. So this is a slide you've seen over and over again tonight in terms of the $4.2 billion that we're investing in the CSO program to date and an additional $5 billion that is um, part of the investment strategy of the new long-term control plan since 2012. So on top of the 4.2 for CSO control, we are looking at investing an additional approximately $5 billion dollars so um, that's a total of $9.2 billion. But what's really important to look at is we look at the gray bar to the left, if I could just walk you through the slide together, and you can see that we're at about 25 billion gallons a year of CSO, which is quite a lot. Um, but we make that investment in the um, CSOs of 4.2, you can see that depicted by the green bar, and what we see is a drop in 5.6 billion gallons a year. So we think that's a worthwhile investment, but it is expensive. And then we go to this latest iteration of planning, and um, I forget, Jim, how many of nine LTCPs were submitted. Um, we have an additional five billion, and we see another drop of 3.2 billion gallons in CSO reduction. So it's quite a lot of money, and what we're starting to see is the law of diminishing returns. Um, that said, we still think these are very important projects, but we understand that the financial capability of the ratepayers really plays a role in all of this. So, oops. Now, for those of you that were quick studies, I wanted to ask, if anybody in the room knows, in fact, what they pay for water and sewer. Does anybody receive a bill from DEP directly? Do you have a sense of what you're paying for water and sewer? About $50 a month. Okay, that's great. That's great to hear. And I broke that down. So for a single family home, they're paying um, about $1,000 um, a year. And what we're seeing is that if you break that down even further, you're looking at just over a penny per gallon for both drinking water and wastewater services, which is really a pretty remarkable bargain in the city of New York. It's probably, um, you know, this is our award-winning water. So uh, the 52 cents per gallon is for the drinking water, 83 per, uh, cents per gallon is for your um, wastewater services, including your storm water, and your um, sewer distribution, as well as the treatment that Pam Lardo spoke about and Jim did as well. So um, we continue to uh, be able to afford these great projects because DEP has an amazing bond rating. Um, we are very, very strong um, in terms of our uh, debt structure. So that is a really um, incredible pillar and that allows us to borrow at very low interest rates. In addition, um, it's important to point out that mandated projects um, between the years 2000 and 2018 accounted for about 50% of our spending. That is not to say that mandated means that we were forced into these projects. Many of these projects and most of these projects were really 
terrific um, additions to the DEP portfolio. They also imported, um, included very important drinking water treatment projects. So these are really good projects. Um, and then those mandated projects, on average, cost the customer about $240 of that bill. There's the annual bill of, at, that I mentioned, $1,055 for a single family home on average. So again, when we're looking at the story um, of finances, we're looking at a story that tells us population is increasing, the green line on the, on the top, 8.6 million people, um, and we actually deliver water to over 9 million people because we're delivering upstate as well. Um, and then we're looking at the daily demand on average going down quite a bit since 1992. And we were, I think, um, the historic high might have been around 1.6 billion. We never thought we would see this trend line. We never thought we would see the demand coming down. This is related to very efficient um, fixtures, also to DEP's program for automatic meter reading. Our customers now have more efficient fixtures and they also know and they have a clearer sense of how much water that they're using because we can read their bills hourly and we can see and send the messages for how much water people are using and they can control costs, quite frankly, quite a bit more. And then you can see on the bottom slide, we're showing our water and sewer rates. Still an incredible bargain. There's the, this is a dollar thirty-five per 100 gallons or just a little over a penny for one gallon. And we're showing you that that has steadily increased since 1992. And as I believe was already mentioned, that's about uh, nearly a tripling since the year 2000. So we just want to be conscious of this. And the reason why is because we have um, a city that has very few people in the mid-range on income. They're either at the lowest tiers on the income spectrum or at the highest tiers on the income spectrum. And so when we look at the median household income for the United States and New York City, it's roughly equivalent, but the percent of residents below the poverty level in New York City is really quite large, 19% of the population living below um, the poverty level, and that's about 1.6 million people. So that's about as large as the city of Philadelphia's total population, the city of Philadelphia being the sixth largest city in the country. So quite a lot of population in that bracket. And again, I'm showing the Bronx and the different boroughs because you can see the income levels um, vary dramatically across the, the city. And we also recognize that it's not just drinking water and wastewater that um, folks are paying. We are also in an area of the country where our housing and shelter costs are quite high and our transportation costs are high. So we have a lot of costs that we have to be conscious about. And when we look at the wastewater costs for households at the 20th percentile, we see that in 2018, those folks are paying about 2.6%. And this is just wastewater. This is not the drinking water included. So they're paying about 2.6% of their household income on wastewater. And then we see at the 40th percentile, it goes down to 1.2%. So again, that's as a result of the breakdown between the 20th percentile income taking in about $19,000 a year and the 40th percentile taking in roughly double. So we're very conscious of that lowest sector because we can see when you move all the way to the right, that green um, bar is showing you that households paying more than 2% of income on wastewater services, 26% of the population. And then again, if you're looking to include the 40th percentile, which are only making $42,000 a year, they're paying 37% of their income on wastewater services. So again, um, not necessarily a story for the average income earner or the high income earner, but certainly um, an impact to consider when you're looking at these sectors of our population. And DEP, like many other cities, um, has a uniform rate structure. So that's a requirement of state law. We have to charge like customers, um, like fees for services. Oops. So just lastly, I wanted to highlight that we are um, 
always striving to do some assistance programs, customer assistance programs. The home water assistance program was founded, I believe, in the year 2015. Current recipients are about 65,000 customers, and these are single family or tax class, uh, single two and three family um, tax class one properties. And uh, these homeowners are basically, we don't want to do eligibility requirements. So if you qualify for the federal heat um, and energy assistance program, you qualify for this program. Um, likewise, the multifamily water assistance program is qualified by HPD. If you qualify for the HPD program, you're automatically qualified for this program. And this is to looking to assist units. So we're giving $250 bill credit per residential unit for property owners, um, agreeing to at least a 15-year period. And that's help, currently helping about 40,000 units. And then we have the forgiveness programs. And um, in total, we're looking at total benefits of about $21 million per year. Um, finally, we also have a multifamily conservation program. So for large um, uh, apartment complexes such as NYCHA, which make up about 90% of our multifamily conservation program customers, um, they are uh, agreeing to conservation fixtures up front, and then they're able to pay on a, sort of a frontage or an average bill, rather than being based on a metered bill. A lot of those bigger uh, complexes like that, they're assured of their water bill, um, and it gives them certainty, it gives us certainty in revenue, so there's a lot of pluses to that. I can get into more detail later if anybody wants to see me after the meeting. Okay, I'm segueing now into our green infrastructure program. Uh, I don't know how many of you know this green infrastructure program. If you just, by show of hands, tell me if you understand what green infrastructure is. Awesome, that makes me smile. Okay. So as the commissioner said, just for anybody who is in the room doesn't understand, it's really simple. It's controlling the stormwater at the source, right? You can think of green infrastructure, you can think of um, site control or source control for stormwater. And these are the various ways we're doing it. We're doing it in the city sidewalks. That's an example of a rain garden. To the right, upper right, we're showing you a bulb out or a green infrastructure installation on a city street. This could also act as a traffic calming measure. So we, we really like the ability to do these um, because it also gives us a lot of additional capture. We're looking at the public property retrofits on the lower left corner and private property um, green roof that was funded for the Brooklyn Navy Yard, Building 3, I think. Um, and what's so great about this, which you might not see from these pictures, is that underneath these installations, you've got crushed gravel and stone and void space, and you're doing subsurface um, detention. And then we're able to, on top, in many cases, um, install green infrastructure, which is aesthetically pleasing, helps um, us with ecosystem and, and you know avian life and um, insects. And it's really been somewhat remarkable to see some of the transformation in some of these neighborhoods that are really starved for some green space. And this is the new look and feel of our annual report. So if anybody wants to learn a little bit more about green infrastructure, all of the annual reports are uh, on the website, that link below. Um, we worked really hard to try to brand the program a little bit. Um, we really want to get as much recognition by our residents as possible for the program. Um, we'd like to continue to build on um, local resident stewardship for these um, installations as well, because that's really important. But some of the things in this picture on top is really showing a school. The school transformations have been really incredible because that AstroTurf field surrounded by a running track provides for um, a very large amount of stormwater capture on site and also has been able to transform these schoolyards so that they can become truly active recreational areas to be enjoyed not only by the students, but also by the surrounding neighborhoods because these schools are staying open and trying to encourage a park within a 10 minute walk to every residence. That's a program that we've been working on with the Trust for Public Plan, but we'll go beyond that working directly with the Department of Education. 
And just a uh, program snapshot, I was here last year and I gave you a snapshot. I'm pleased to report that we have encumbered even more funding. We have one billion budgeted over the next 10 years. Our expenses or operating budget is indicated here about 12 million a year um, through 12, uh, fiscal year 12 to 17 and 11 million budgeted between fiscal year 18 and 19. So maintenance is expensive. Um, but well worthwhile, I think. And we have, as the commissioner mentioned earlier, or, or Jim, I think actually, sorry, mentioned, that we have installed over 4,300 green infrastructure assets, and we are currently managing 465 green acres. So I'm very proud of that. And the dots that you're seeing here, I don't expect you to see them all, but just the color coding are blue, are in final design. All of those um, lime green are in construction and the bright green are already constructed sites. So they're popping up everywhere. And as um, I mentioned, the key uh, steps now for this program are really looking at the um, public property opportunities. So again, working with the schools, working with the New York City Housing Authority, um, working with the parklands, lots of opportunity for the parklands, retrofits. We're really pleased to announce that we have um, many design contracts teed up and ready to go. So once we get those designs completed, we will be starting active construction and this is essentially showing you um, how many we've constructed, what's in construction, what's in design. And as you can see, as we move through this process, we think that we will have a, a total of 450 um, public property um, installations very soon. Very cost-effective program here. And then the private property um, program, Melissa, you know, is here from our staff, and she's been working really hard to do a one-of-a-kind, very um, unique um, green infrastructure grant program. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is the um, program that we currently have now with the green infrastructure grant program um, that has 34 property owners and new green roof incentives that people can be certain if you apply for this green roof, if you can collect this kind of rainfall, we will guarantee that we will pay you up to $30 a square foot. So we're trying to give property owners a clearer understanding of what we will reimburse for green roofs, hoping to stimulate that economy. And then finally, this is where I was going. We have a $53 million request for proposals um, that was released November 9th, and we are looking to secure a third party administrator to implement a voluntary incentive program on private property. Um, the idea will be that we will target low hanging fruit, um, very cost effective, large um, private properties that would sign up for this program. They would work and all their transaction um, would occur with the uh, private uh, grant, the, the person that is granted this RFP, so who was awarded this RFP, is the administrator and they would work with the property owners to um, stand this program up. We're showing an example of uh, property to retrofit. What that red is showing is all the impervious area on that particular parcel. And what they would do is look for opportunities to capture that water. They would look for an opportunity to retrofit that existing site. Because again, we are looking for um, properties as they turn over in the city to comply with new rules and to do new detention. But we're also looking to retrofit all the hardscape that we already have created. Um, and this is an example of the right-of-way maintenance crews at DEP. Um, they maintain uh, all of our green infrastructure in the public right-of-way. We have 60 plus, we're calling them green jobs. Um, this is a really terrific program, gets people in um, the DEP sort of career ladder of success. And they're really uh, been a remarkable crew, so they're coming in, they're learning on the job, and they're doing an amazing um, job of removing litter and taking care of the plants and all the material and um, adjusting the soil conditions as needed. Okay, that's time for questions. Yes, so thank you so much, Angela. So we do have time for um, a few questions on green infrastructure and affordability. Uh, yeah, Corinne? Thank you. Um, 
can I ask two questions? <laughs> uh, why don't you start with one, and let's see if anybody else has one. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, a question about um, green infrastructure um, on public property that's not initiated by DEP, that is not in priority watersheds for the green infrastructure program. Um, I know that the Parks Department is um, wrapping up a Harlem River watershed plan where they are proposing green infrastructure on a lot of um, exist on a lot of park uh, city-owned parkland, um, and they're working on designs and schematics for it. Um, and I'm wondering if DEP will be able to fund those projects, even though they're not in the right of way, um, or sorry, not in a priority watershed. And um, if they're if they're not looking, if they're if DEP is not looking towards funding projects that are not in the priority watershed, when could parks or another city agency expect funding from DEP? Um, and non-priority watersheds? That's a good question. I mean, our program is currently very focused on the CSO area, although we do we did open the grant program to include both um, CSO and MS4, but that would not be applicable to the Parks Department itself. Parks will have certain obligations for green infrastructure under their MS, uh, the city's MS4 permit, which is the municipal storm, uh, separate storm sewer system permit. Um, other than that, I don't know, Denard, did they have any opportunities to get funding from DEP? I don't, I don't think so. Again, because it's not really DEP's mandate, so we have to be very careful with how we collect our money from our ratepayers and what we do with that money, which has to go to what is under DEP's authority. Uh, yeah. uh, Karen? I, I think that um, it you might have misunderstood what Corinne's question was. There are projects that are going on. Um, we've done some design of uh, projects that are in the neighborhood, and some of them are on parkland, some of them are on other pieces of land. It is all within a CSO area, but it's not been an approved LTCP, so none of the money can be spent on green infrastructure in those areas. And so the question isn't whether it's in parks or it's not in parks. The question is, why are we being put onto a secondary level and not being treated like the rest of the city, having to wait till the very end, which may never come at the rate we're going, and not getting things done what that needs to be done. And so um, the question is, how come green infrastructure funding is not going to be expended by the DEP in areas that are not in approved LTCPs. Okay, so I think maybe if I'm getting to the heart of your question, we have prioritized those water bodies where we are struggling to meet water quality standards. So all those tributary areas to those water bodies are where we have initially focused the CSO program. So I guess, I guess I was leaving my question until the end with the public participation, um, and I can do that, but I guess I'm at a loss as to what you're doing. And I would appreciate if there was a written document that would start with, this is the city of New York, these are how many miles we have, this is the sewer treatment, these are our goals, this is how we're getting to our goals, and on and on, and describe how things happen, because it seems like to me, and I've been following this for a long time, that it's a little health skeleton and it's hard to figure out where you're going and doing what. Um, and so in, in particular, the Harlem River is, I guess it's a tributary of the East River. I don't know how you consider that something that you didn't take care of, but we are in a desperate situation. We need help on taking care of a CSO facility that is not working. There's so yeah, Karen, I definitely appreciate and thank you for your patience. Um, and I understand that you've been at the whole, uh, end of a long list of priority water bodies with respect to the open waters. That's our final plan. Um, we're in the midst of uh, doing that plan now and Tibbetts Brook will get attention in that plan. 
Um, so it is just the way we teed up with the state when we did our, okay, here is how many water body um, plans that we have to go through from 2012 until the, the end of those, and there was 11 plans that were due. So they were staggered and open waters was just at the end. It's considered a wrap up, but we can talk a little bit more about Tibbetts in just a little bit. Um, so I'm sorry, I, I do have to move on to the next presentation, but again, we will still have time for additional questions at the end. So I do want to introduce um, Pinar Balsi, who's going to be giving us an update on our water body advisory systems, um, as well as the NYC Trash Free Waters program in our work to reduce floatables. All right, wonderful. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking about two initiatives that many of you here actually have partnered with us. Um, the first one that I would like to share some updates is the water body advisories that we are issuing through the emails if you sign up with that program. So we initiated this effort a couple years ago um, with Stevens Institute of Technology using their high-end resolution NIHOPS model to update what we had at the time in order to um, come up with, um, apply the new standards and also expand it specially. So, so what we have done the last couple of years working with many of you is we created new regression curves to make the correlation between the rainfall and the water quality response. So the users, the end users, those recreational voters can get updated advisories whenever needed. So this was our first effort. Um, we are launching this in the spring of 2019. And um, the new update that you are going to be getting is actually now um, going to increase the advisories. So we are going to most likely go from the 28 advisories to 45. And also some water body advisories may take place more often than, than before. So this was our phase one. We recently completed. And um, the phase two, which we just started and we have held a workshop with many of you um, several months ago to scope the phase two. It really builds upon the phase one, but we heard many of you that it's not enough. You know, it's, it's a good notification system. We want to know what the water quality response, but what we most want to know is what's happening at the outfall point. Meaning like I want to get, if I'm a boat launcher and I would like to take a boat launch, and this is actually quite a big map, but what it intends to do is it shows the boat launch areas, and there are around 54 in New York City, according to this map, and the outfall. So we heard from you that you would like to know when you want to get into the water, if that specific outfall closer to that boat launch location is discharging or not. So um, there are a couple other questions we ask, you know, what is the preferred notification system? And many of you said, we would like to be like the WAIT program, which is, you know, app um, uh, text-based, which I'm going to be talking about that. And um, so what we are currently doing is coping this pilot notification system, which we call it phase two. We've been in touch with Rob and the team um, to identify 10 to 15 CSO outfalls where we can target the notification system and see if our model can really dive deep into that special level and give us the information that we are seeking. So we'll be in touch with you all um, in the next upcoming month or two to be able to pick the 10 to 15 locations. I got the first list from Rob, thank you for that. And uh, it's quite a list, so we have to really dive deep and pick 10 to 15 locations. Uh, but I ask Ellen to reach out to you all. So talking about the WAIT program, this is um, one of the initiatives that we worked very closely again, thanks to Newtown Creek Alliance, um, helped us with this initial idea, which we implemented in 2016. It's a behavioral change program. It's the first one in the nation, which we are very proud of. So if you sign up with us under this notification system through the text, you get an email and a text message saying when it's really raining heavily, we ask you to wait, meaning that don't take a shower, don't do laundry, don't do dishwashers or anything that's relevant to water, stop using the water. So what the intent is by this behavioral change, we can actually see a change at the end of the pipe. That means that we are getting less water into the system, that means less CSO discharge in those, the, during those heavy rainfall events. Um, we completed the phase one, 
and we had in this our initial pilot we had around 379 participants we captured 13 CSO events and the major success is 5% increase in the CSOs which is which is which is a wonderful result for the phase one currently we are in phase two um, it happens to be in my neighborhood and my eight-year-old daughter was so excited to get the notification and she went door by door for like five blocks to make sure that our neighbors signed up. So I think the 700 is because of her efforts. No, I'm just joking. But it is, it is a really good bump up from the phase one. We have 700 participants now and we are ending it May 2019. So we are going to look into results and the ultimate goal is to expand it to citywide. Um, another initiative that, again, we've been working with many of you in this room is our New York City Trash Free Waters. Um, we started this several years ago. I think EPA started this with the same um, topic, the Trash Free Waters Nationwide Initiative. And um, recently we built upon that lessons learned um, from the pets and we created our New York City Trash Free Waters. Um, you know, looking at the trash, I mean, we all know it's a common problem, especially during this time of the year, which there's a lot of tourists coming in the town and trashing our streets. But looking at the end of the pipe, um, we have really good results. I didn't want to put a very busy graph here, but we have a very long-term monitoring data, uh, which we published. You cannot read it, but it's in the footnote if you are interested. For the last um, 10 plus years, we've been monitoring the trash um, in the waterways, both us, uh, meaning the DEP staff under PEM, but also many of you are engaged with us on this monitoring effort. So looking at the open waters, you know, we are seeing a very high percentage in terms of the good to very good ratings. It's 95% and above. Near shore follows the same, it's 90 and up. Where we are seeing lower values are during the sh in the shoreline. So we went dive deep into that shoreline data and we said, okay, what are these water bodies, the shorelines, that we may be having um, less of a rating, meaning, you know, like poor to pair rating. And those water bodies that we identify are Bergen uh, Basin in one of the traps in Jamaica Bay, uh, Shipset Bay in Brooklyn, Newtown Creek, Coney Island and Flushing Bay that we have seen some lower ratings. Um, so majority of these water bodies, as you know, are um, separately stored. So what we did, said that, okay, you know, we really need to go dive deep into this and do a analysis or a study to understand what is really coming from the separately stored areas that may be ending up having a um, fair to poor rating. So um, Anything that you look at the separately sewered areas when it comes to trash, and that's actually the, the heart of the New York City Trash Water Freeze Program is don't tackle the end of the pipe, tackle the source. And that's where it comes is really through public education. So many, many of the media campaigns that we run um, in the recent years, and the most recent one is our Don't Trash Our Waters campaign that we ran last year in Coney Island, and we really seen some um, beneficial results in terms of the public understanding. So we are continuing this effort. Um, majority of it is now happening in schools because we believe that if you educate the kids, they make sure the, the parents' um, behavioral change. So um, the other efforts that we are doing on the source control, again, um, in the MS4 areas, and mostly citywide, is adopt a catch basin effort. We initiated that working with some local organizations. Uh, we've been running the clean water, clean beaches for some time around. Now, every summer with EPA, adopt a basket program and forgot to back, which is a new one that came from our sister agency, Parks Department. So what is ultimately going to happen when it comes to, I'm going to take you back to this first question that I asked, what's happening in these separate sewer areas? So we said we really need to do a loading rate study. And um, again, this is another wonderful partnership that we have worked with you um, on scoping the loading rate study. And it was part of our MS4 stormwater management plan to determine the loading rate coming from these separate sewer areas. So, we are um, moving with that effort. Um, we identify 
um, several catch basins that we are, we are going to be doing um, monitoring that's going to be tied with modeling efforts on top of it. And in the next couple of months, we'll be meeting with you to share some of our picked locations in terms of the catch basins and get the feedback from you. So that really completes my presentation. Um, but we do have time for <coughs> questions on the water body advisories or the NIC trash free water. Yeah, uh, the WIC program, will it be based on real-time monitoring of the CSOs per solution in terms of notifying the public of when an event is about to occur or has occurred? Um, the WIC program is driven by the rainfall. Um, so when we measure, you know, we have several rainfall gauges that we measure the rainfall that includes our treatment plants, the 14 treatment plants and uh, the airport. So when we start seeing heavy rainfalls, that is actually before the CSO happens, we want to avoid the use. We, you know, we, we want to be proactive rather than reactive. So whenever it starts hitting heavily, that we know that is potentially have a CSO notification, we actually tell people stop now. So that's when you start like it's really based on the rainfall um, notification than the CSO I notification. I understand that, but many times the rainfall is not that correlated on a real time, based on time, to the actual period of the CSO. If you man monitor the CSO and when it was at 80%, you know, 20% from the top, you could then issue a notification. So it would really be based on the period of time they need to not use water. The shorter, the shorter that period would right. be, the more effective would be the public's response. If they have an eight-hour an eight period, it's hard for them not to use water. If it's a shorter period, it would be more well, effective. I am on it, and um, I can say from my experience, because I have two kids, and one of them is a teenager who wants to shower every day, it is not a long notification. It is, it's, it's really driven by the rainfall, so whatever that rainfall event starts and ends, it's like two to three hours that I personally stop using the water at the most. So for the slide said 7.2 hours per CSO. Depends on the area that you have. On the phase one we did, but in this one that I'm getting is, it's usually I'm ending in, so I'm in the Barber Bay treatment area. The first one was in the Newton treatment area. So I think that's why we are having um, different notifications. But me personally, at the most, I got three hours, and then it, the message came, and then we started using. On the Barber Bay, the Newtown Creek, I think it was on average 7.2 hours. And that is a long time indeed, and there was actually an NPR um, discussion on that, <laughs> that many people said that we start using, but after some time we start using again, because you know you can't really hold yourself for a long time. So um, we will continue to improve the process and we'll definitely take that into consideration. Have you tried to correlate the actual CSO when it's, you know, when it's occurring with your rain forecast? We are looking at it now in the pilot program, yes. I mean, that's the water body advisory system is that notification system, the correlation between the rainfall and the CSO uh, discharge. <clears throat> Um, any other questions? Yeah, Willis. Uh, thank you, Pinar. I, I had a, just a couple quick comments about the trash free waters. I think it's great that you're looking at MS4 areas, but it's, you know, the problem is so much more severe than just litter, and especially when you have industrial areas, it's not necessarily, uh, it's definitely not tourists coming through and, and, and dumping off trash. And there's a big problem with a lot of streets that either are MS4 or direct drainage. And we've talked about this a number of times. There's so many areas on Newtown Creek where there's direct flow, and you can literally sit there in a rainstorm and watch trash wash directly into the creek. So it's not a, an issue about the sewer system or about awareness from pedestrians. There's a much bigger issue there, and um, it would really be great to see some quicker measures put in place to really think about uh, as we're literally washing floatables, uh, wash into the creek. So. I encourage you guys to, t to take that up as part of this MS4 investigation, that's all. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, Ms. in the sweater. Hi, Diana Fu with Bronx River Alliance. I wanted to ask what was being done about um, 
waterways that uh, span multiple municipalities. So as most people know, the Bronx River is a mainland river. Um, and in the headwaters and upstream, it's MS4. And then when it reaches the Bronx, it becomes CSO. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what's being done about that. I mean, we've been working with you, and I think because of the boom you installed at the head end, um, that really captures the flow coming from the Westchester, that I'm hearing from our operational staff that really improved what's happening in the downstream. <coughs> so that was um, a wonderful effort. And I mean, you know, when it comes to installing or maintaining booms in other people's jurisdiction, it's really not you know, that's why we hit the Bronx River in the past. It was capturing everything coming down, but since we installed the boom, we are seeing less coming down in, in our boom, so less maintenance. Um, in terms of answering your question, I think it is a multi-jurisdictional effort that falls under the state jurisdiction that um, we've been working with Westchester County in terms of what they are doing upstream, but it's really, we don't have much of the upper hand in terms of dictating what needs to be done in Westchester. So um, I, I wanted to ask you a question. Are you still keeping that boom? Yes. Okay. I'm actually on the boom most days. Mm -hmm. so, yes. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it has is, it is definitely helped us a lot on the downstream. Um, it looks like we have time for one more question before we go on to the next presenter. Uh, yes, Ms. Lee, the back. Hi, this is Nina Shem from Nation Conservancy. I uh, it's really great to see uh, the EPO seeing behavior change in um, to get people um, help with the CSO events. So I was wondering, uh, with all the social media, uh, it's so easy to reach people. Uh, why, um, why is it only seven hundred people in phase two versus like thousands? Well, because we need to measure if. The pe people need to sign up with us, with our um, pilot the notification system, so we know who we reached out. As Angela mentioned, that we have um, we actually have a meter for each household, so we can um, measure their water use during the time that the notification is issued. If, if we reach out to a person X that we don't know where that person X lives, or then we don't have that access of the information because otherwise we won't be able to measure did they really stop using the water you know we each household the single family household we have a DEP meter that we can regularly go to that address and see did they really have done any stopping of the use during that period of the time that notification is issued that's that's one thing I think social media would be great but we had to have a specific location of a particular participant sign up. And just to sort of echo that and clarify, this is just the pilot. So that's why we had specific locations looking for specific areas for people to sign up. But as we look into expanding citywide and moving beyond the pilot phase, then yes, definitely we'll expand the social media outreach that we did even for going this far. I mean, from the social media, I think we already done that. Like we utilize the social media to reach out people, but as I said, we have to have a per, um, particular location for each individual signing up with us. Um, so thank you, Pinar. I think with that, we're going to transition to Keith, who is going to be talking about um, our next LTCP, which is due, which is the um, citywide open waters LTCP. Good evening, everyone. I'm Keith Mahoney. I'm director with Water Poly Planning. I'll be going over the scope of the uh, citywide CSO Low and Term Control Plan. So this um, citywide open water long term control plan really builds off of our last 10 submitted long term control plans, nine of which have been approved, and Jamaica Bay one is still pending. And this one really focuses on the open waters, which we show on the map that consists of the Hudson River, the Harlem River, the East River, Western Long Island Sound, the New York Bay, Lower and Upper New York Bay, and the um, Arthur Kill and the Kill Van Cull water bodies. And some of these water bodies are shared water bodies with New Jersey, so we've been coordinating closely with New Jersey. Sheldon's here, Bridget from PVSCs has been extremely helpful. 
So we've been sharing our water quality data. We've been sharing our modeling outputs, just simply modeling water bodies. And the shared water body consists of the Hudson River, the um, Arthur Kill and Kilban Cull, as, as well as the Raritan Bay, which is that lower portion. And lastly, we recently submitted a modification request for an extension of time on the citywide long-term control plan. And the main drivers for this is really the complexity of the open waters, where this one consists of nine drainage areas, as well as all these water bodies. And we also wanted to incorporate a more robust public participation plan, which uh, Mikel will be talking about later. DC has issued a preliminary approval, and the next steps will be posting it to ENB for public comments. But right now, we're requesting an extension of March 2020. So in terms of the completed work on this open waters um, long-term control plan, and some of the data we presented already, we've done a robust sampling program, both in the water quality, the ambient sampling, where we sampled bacteria, dissolved oxygen, as well as a bunch of upland flow monitoring that we use to calibrate our landside models, as well as validate the landside models. So you see all that sampling that's been done, and this is in addition to some of the a uh, harbor survey sampling that does uh, almost 100 stations in the harbor. So we really focus on wet weather <coughs> events, and all this was used to calibrate our models, both water quality and the sewer system models. So the 2019 look ahead, we uh, want to kind of use this data we've collected, and some of the flow lines are actually still ongoing, to calibrate again the landside models and the water quality models. The other thing we've done with the water quality models is we refine the grid resolution. We're trying to capture some of the invadements, things like flood milk channel, things where there may be less flow and all. We want to make sure we actively model the water by those invadements, as well as we have boat launches, things like that. So we refine the model grid resolution. We also had some near shore sampling locations to help calibrate those models. So that's one thing we've been doing. We'll be, we'll be looking at incentive areas. Again, now look at boat launches, as well as beaches and things, anything that may be impacted negatively from these CSLs. So we'll look at all the potential impairments based on all these calibrated models. The next step is the alternative development. And again, this goes with the EPA CSO policy. We have to look at a wide range. <coughs> Jim presented the toolbox of everything we look at, ecological, source control, um, CSO treatment all the way up to CSO storage. So we'll be looking at those, but we'll focus, I'll show you some slides the alternatives we're thinking about. Again, we're, uh, as I mentioned, this is nine different drain areas we're talking about for the uh, wastewater resource recovery facilities. And uh, you're probably talking well over um, 200 regulators we'll be looking at. So a lot of this will be looking at optimization, things like that. So we'll be looking at all the alternatives development. And again, it will all lead into the LTCP development that's now due March 2020. And it's going to have a very robust public participation program where all of this will be provided to the public, even the recommended plan, well before the final submittal of this long-term control plan. Uh, this is just kind of an example of some things we'll be looking at. Like I said, we'll look at all the alternatives in the toolbox, but these are things we shortlisted. And again, sewer system optimization. Like I said, we're looking at nine drainage areas, probably 200 regulators. This is some of the sense of regulators, but when we look at the sewer system, we really have to look at it holistically. And we'll look at a way to optimize the sewer system. We want to convey more wet weather flow to the plant. We want to reduce CSO volume frequency very cost effectively, while not uh, detri detrimentally impacting upland sewer system. That's surcharging sewers. We don't want to increase any sort of um, sewer backups or anything, so we want to keep it hydraulically neutral, but really try to reduce the CSO volume and frequency and maximize the wet weather flow to the treatment plants. So the other thing we've been looking at is things like, and this really goes into source control. This is something that's been out there for a while. I know a lot of people aware of this project. It's been there for a long time. Is the daylighting of Tibbetts Brook. In the past, uh, Tibbetts Brook used to go to stream, used to drainage drain right to the Hall River. With all the development and all, that flow is diverted into a combined sewer to go to Woods Island treatment plant. So this concept is simply taking out a combined sewer and conveying that flow directly to the Hall River. Uh, we're doing some updated model runs. In the past model runs, I think we had about two to 300 billion gallon per year reduction of CSO out of the uh, outfall of WI-56 that goes to the Hall River. So that's something we're looking at seriously. We're trying to expedite some of these alternative evaluations 
from reaching out to um, try and coordinate now with parks and uh, the um, railroad and things like that just to see how viable this is. Uh, there's also another project, we're not going to show a slide on it, it's for Central Park, we're lo lo looking at water reuse. So that one helps with the water demand, so instead of using city water for any irrigation and things, we'll try to reuse the lake water, we'll take it out of the sewer system, which has benefits and also reduces CSL. So that's another source control we'll be looking at under the citywide. So in terms of the attainment, and these are still preliminary model runs, we've just got the updated um, model outputs from New Jersey, and we've been doing some refinements. But we, this is what we kind of call a gap analysis. We want to see what the attainment looks like currently on, on the baseline conditions. So this shows fecal coliform, and this is a monthly geodine annual of uh, less than 200. And right now, based on the modeling and all the sampling we did, we're in full attainment with the fecal coliform in the open waters. <coughs> with the exception of one station, which I can't find it up there. Oh, thank you. And that one is very close. So again, these are preliminary runs. Uh, the other thing we looked at is potential future compliance, and we looked at the Intero. And this one was based on a seasonal compliance. That's May 1st through October 31st. And again, so when we looked at the stations, all the stations meant the 30-day rolling geo mean of um, 35. But in terms of 17 stations didn't meet the statistical threshold value, the SDB of 130. And that's at 90% of the samples have to be less than 130. And that was particularly, again, in the East River and things like that. So we looked at that just to see what what would the picture look like? And the other thing we noticed is, um, again, when you start going near shore, we also saw some non-attainment with the SDB. And that, that's in the coastal waters right there in the upper bay. So again, this preliminary look at it, but it's just something we want to assess in terms of moving forward, trying to prioritize where we're going to look at CSO reductions and things. And we'll pr provide more information at the next meetings as we have the updated model and start uh, advancing some of this alternative evaluations. I just had a question about trying to bring the two budgets together, um, one long-term control plan and one the GI budget. So we just heard about the commitment from the Deputy Commissioner to GI. Um, the original um, modification of your consent decree from 2012 stipulated a 1.5 percent um, managed area that would be devoted to uh, GI and also a certain number. Um, so I wanted to know whether uh, for long-term control planning you're still working within the framework of that um, 2012 agreement with DEC or whether you're prepared, able, and willing to expand um, the commitment um, from the LTCP agreement to GI uh, moving forward into open waters. That's a big question. I'll leave that to Pinar and Angela. Mm -hmm. Both of you. <laughs> yeah, we, we have started into priority areas, but we probably will be expanding the investments in some of the other areas that are depicted by this last long-term control plan. And that's primarily because the we are going to run out of space in some of the priority areas. So, for instance, as an example, um, the grant program is open citywide. Um, the private incentive program would include properties that are outside of those priority long-term control plan areas. So we're open to making those investments. We just have prioritized and started with the water bodies that are struggling to comply with the standards, um, but then we would see ourselves expanding. We don't necessarily have approval for a much larger budget. Um, currently, the budget is anticipated to be um, $1.5 billion. So that the budget, but is the uh, DEP putting a cap um, or abiding by the previous agreement that they made with DEC as the minimum of what they will spend and commit to GI? Absolutely, yes. Are they willing to exceed and go beyond? 
Well, that's what we have. We, we have a 20 year program, so it's a little premature. I haven't even gotten to the point where we're still trying to meet those goals of the 2012 consent order. So we really, until we get to that point, I don't think we'll make new decisions about going beyond that. All right, speaking on the, the Harlem and uh, Hudson mm -hmm. River uh, watershed and sewer shed, it's vital uh, that we get uh, the two sides of DP talking to each other to make sure we're getting the maximum prevention we talk all the time. We have, I mean, we actually do, we, we do have a long-term control plan executive staff meeting. Most of the people here are in that meeting. We're constantly communicating on this. And in fact, I think we might be um, in a bit of a tug of war over who gets to claim Tibbetts Brook. <laughs> I see it as green, and we see it as gray. Yeah. But yeah, no, we're coordinating. Thank you. We're also looking at Emmett's four areas conceptually, and also the GI, so we are trying to expand. Um, any other questions, uh, Larry? Uh, yeah. Can you turn on the mic? Thanks. Um, question on the, the extension, and, and this may sort of be getting ahead of the public participation piece a bit, so feel free to hold the question and defer it if you want to call. Um, the, um, <coughs> You alluded to the uh, fact that the recommended plan would be presented well before uh, it has to go into to D DC in March of 2020, the proposed date, right? Um, we had seen from DEC that they sent a letter last, was it last week, I think, to DEP basically approving of the request for the extension, and DEC spelled out some conditions in there, um, and they seem to be talking about um, publicly circulating a synopsis yes. right, of the plan, not the plan itself. And then they, they seem to be talking about, uh, in terms of public comment and responding to public comment, there was some obligation at an earlier stage uh, when you were doing the screening of alternatives to also be releasing a synopsis and taking comments and responding to comments. But then at the, at the end, that last phase of the synopsis of the recommended plan, there didn't seem to be a uh, uh, stipulation or a condition of DP's actually going to address and respond to the comments before they submit the plan to DEC. Are we reading that right? And if that's if that is right, um, I guess I'm calling I'm calling a question whether DEP really is going to be doing uh, uh, what it says it intends to be doing uh, around actually providing full plans for review. Um, so I do have a schedule for the public participation that goes through the summary document. Um, so yeah, let's hold that and then we'll show you the schedule and delve a little bit deeper into your question. Okay. Um, any others? On, yeah, Jamie? Hi. I have an overall question about the Open Borders uh, LTCP. I think just given what Kate presented about the water quality attainment and how for the most part you are in attainment for the regulations does that change the the criteria with which you evaluate benefits compared to the other ltcps where there's larger water quality um, concerns and then if so what criteria would you use i i don't think it changes it again we look at other parameters like we did in the other long term long-term control plans, we look at fecal, we look at potential in terrell, we look at recovery periods, we look at sensitive areas. Again, I just showed sampling stations with the modeling I brought up, we refined the grid. So we're gonna show detailed mosaics trying to look at near shore impairment. So it's gonna be the same process as the other ones. Mm -hmm. I mean, I envision again, and Jim brought this up earlier, I don't envision tunnels or anything because you're talking 200 regulators and things. But I do look at like some specific project with big CSO reductions, sewer system optimization, but we will look at it the same way as the other long-term control plans. And we are, ultimately, we still want to reduce CSOs to the best extent possible. So even regardless of water quality, if there's cost-effective ways to convey more flow to the plan, we will do that. Any last questions? Uh, yeah, the gentleman next to Willis. Hey, good evening, thank you. Um, on the Harlem River, uh, I had the privilege of being a co-chair of this CAG 10 to 14 years ago, I guess. And in the time since, uh, I've made a lot of trips through the Harlem River. 
both on the boat uh, and then involved with swimming events. Uh, and anecdotally, the river gives the swimmer the filthiest experience of any water body in New York City. And I've had more swimmers get sick and throw up in the Harlem River than every other water body in New York City. So my question for the plan and for the city's water quality management strategy is, uh, can you tell us a little more uh, for the sampling stations and the, and the sampling locations that are in the city's harbor survey? You know, how many are on the Harlem River and are we sampling enough on the Harlem River that we really understand how and why that water quality is so bad? I mean, we could follow up on that. Harbor survey, I think, only has one or two stations on the Harlem River. Again, when we did this more robust sampling, we focused a bunch of stations along the Harlem River just to make sure we had the whole spatial impacts. So our sampling, our modeling really includes all those stations to see that. And you specifically targeted wet weather sampling. Wet weather sampling and all along. So we really did the really detailed sampling on the Harlem River. I mean, this was just a short-term sampling where we again three to five wet weather events which we would chase a wet weather event we'd sample two times a day low and high tides for four consecutive days so i mean that's all built into the model in terms of harbor survey i think again it's only one or two stations and it's something we can take back and talk about um and if you're interested in more detail um earlier this year we presented um on the harlem and hudson river portion of this LTCP specifically. Um, those presentations are available online and it has much more detail about where those sampling locations were and what the data was. So, thank you, Keith. Um, so with that, I do want to transition into a discussion about the public participation plan for the Citywide Open Waters LTCP. Um, I think that, you know, when Mike asked his question earlier about sort of what the public, part public participation will be for this plan, if and how will it be improved um, on the earlier efforts to engage the public um, in a robust way, um, what we're offering today is really what we think is um, an opportunity to learn from mistakes that we made in the past. Um, build upon things that we've done well, particularly on the MS4 public engagement side, um, and also offer a compromise with some of the um, concerns that um, we've heard this evening. Um, and so I'll just sort of take a step back and mention that our public participation, our engagement through this program has continued to evolve. I mentioned that, you know, back in, in 2012, even before I moved into public affairs, we would have meetings like this and have maybe five to 10 attendees. Um, and now we have dozens um, upon dozens of people participating. Part of that is because we've really worked on our social media angles. We've made partnerships with local environmental and neighborhood organizations. Um, we've worked with many of you to get the word out about our public meetings, our opportunities to provide public comments. Um, we've gone out with many of you um, to engage on these water bodies, um, and we've really worked to um, improve our responses to public comment letters, both from um, a timing perspective in terms of, of when we're getting comments back to you, um, but also in terms of, of the quality and the content of those responses. Um, and then in, in addition to that, we've really um, held additional meetings. So for those of you who have been a part of this journey with us since 2012, you remember that that original public participation plan um, allocated only about three public meetings per LTCP. And it was very clear that that simply wasn't enough. Um, and so since then, we've done meetings upon request. We've asked um, folks in our water bodies to come and meet with us. Um, so we really haven't assigned a specific number of meetings to our LTCPs any longer. We really want to engage with the folks who not only live and work on these water bodies, but who advocate on their behalf. Um, and so we just have continued to improve and we will continue to do so. Um, so specifically on the citywide open waters LTCP, 
Um, again, initially in that 2012 public participation plan, it said that we would only have one kickoff meeting for that LTCP. Um, and we took a step back and said that's simply not enough. Um, this is a citywide effort. We're engaging essentially every New Yorker that lives, works, recreates near one of these water bodies. Um, and so we held three separate kickoff meetings earlier this year. I know that many of you attended them. If you did not, I really encourage you to go to our website to check out those presentations because they go into a lot more detail of what on what Keith presented earlier, not only from the water quality sampling side, our results side, but also the various projects that have been built um, in these areas. Um, and so we went into the watershed characteristics and the sampling. We looked at existing and planned water quality improvements. We sort of talked about more detail on the LTCP modeling process and the alternatives development. So that's sort of our starting point from in terms of the public engagement on this citywide open waters LTCP. Um, and now is where we're looking into the, the 2019 portion of it. And so Larry, I hope that this sort of addresses your question more specifically. Um, so uh, several of the presenters mentioned tonight that we did request an extension from the state in regards to the LTCP. At the heart of that extension request was really the technical and complexity, uh, the technical challenges and the complexity of this LTCP. And so then we worked to say, okay, based on the scheduling for what has to be done in terms of the modeling, in terms of the alternative analysis, when and how can we engage with the public in a robust way so that we actually have information to present to you that you can respond to. Um, and so what we're proposing is that we will come back to you um, in the spring, April 2019, to hold a series of stakeholder briefings where we'll provide an update on the process that um, Keith mentioned earlier. So where we are in terms of the modeling and the alternatives analysis. Um, this is where we're introducing this concept of the summary document or synopsis document. Um, Karen mentioned earlier, she said, I want to see a document that takes a step back and says, what is the city doing? What's the plan for the Open Waters LTCP? And we really see this summary document as being the answer to that question. I'm going to have another slide on it that goes into the detail, but it's really an opportunity for us to present material from the LTCP in a way that's easier for the public to understand. That's not a 500 page engineering document, but really is a way for folks to read it, give us comments on it. Um, and so we really want to work with the public on the outline for what that summary document will include. So we'll talk about um, the outline for that starting in April. Then in September, we'll come back to you to go through the retained alternatives. So we'll have a draft of that LTCP summary at that time, and we'll give a presentation of the various alternatives, some of which Keith mentioned tonight. So the Tibbetts Brook piece, um, the sewer system optimization, and any other alternatives that we review through that toolbox that Jim presented earlier, then we'll come and we'll present that to you in September. Um, then the public will have 30 days to comment on those alternatives. That's really your opportunity to tell us more about what you think about where our thinking and our analysis is and give us feedback on that side. Um, we will take your comments. We'll continue to look at these retained alternatives, not only from the modeling perspective, but then from the operation side, because everything that we decide to design and construct ultimately has to be maintained and operated. So that's a very long process in terms of engagement within DEP to understand what can be our final recommended plan. Um, and so the goal is to come back to you in January with the recommended plan, with a public meeting, um, and the revised and sort of final version of that summary document. And then Larry, to your question about sort of when are public comments due, um, we would have that presentation in January. The public would have 30 days to give us comments. And then we would respond to your comments and include those responses in our final LTCP submission 
to the state. So that is the current schedule. As you can see, I'm making my way over to this T um, as my voice goes. Um, but that is the current schedule that we are working with. Um, and then lastly, I want to go into a little more detail on this summary document. One of the things that we've been challenged with here at DEP, and I know a lot of city agencies are facing this, um, is really how do we make our documents more accessible to the public? Um, there's a citywide initiative um, in terms of plain language. Many of our um, staff members within DEP have been going through what we call plain language classes to really take these policy documents, these technical documents, and make them more accessible to the public. And I think many of you have responded back to us and said, hey, we like reading your MS4 stormwater management plan a lot better than we like reading your 500-page LTCP document. Now, of course, we still need to prepare that 500-page LTCP because um, we need to submit it to our friends at DEC, but we want to make sure that we're also um, engaging with you in a way that's um, clear, that uses more graphics, more design elements, and we've started to do that not only with the um, MS4 document, but also with the uh, Jamaica Bay LTCP. So that summary is going to highlight the alternatives. It will have the details of the recommended plan, the schedules, and the costs. And this is the document that the public will be able to review from the start when we first begin to outline it um, until it is submitted with the final LTCP um, to the state in March 2020. So with that, I'll take the very many questions that I know are coming. Uh, yes. First, I want to thank you uh, for acknowledging that date lighting to this book is a viable solution or something you're at least looking into. <laughs> so we appreciate that. Um, my question actually goes back to the commissioner when he was speaking. If I understood correctly, he did say that you know treating water does cost a certain amount of money per gallon, which I thought, and then a few years ago, someone from the DEP told me that wasn't true. Um, but now that I'm saying it's true, do you have a price tag, like an average price of how much it costs to treat water? Yeah, I believe that was in Angeles. Okay, so that, I wasn't sure if that was what a resident pays, but what it actually costs the city, I'm assuming, is not exactly what a resident pays. Um, I'm not sure I, I'm following your question. Angela, do you? Is it the same? Yeah, so it's we're, It's not that we um, sort of earn. Hmm? You have to go back to the commissioner's presentation. She's asking for total cost per gallon. Sorry, you're asking about this slide or the. The operating cost of what does it cost the GEP? to treat water at a treatment plant, like per gallon? Yes, grab a microphone. There's um, in front of Angela. So we track cost of treatment at every wastewater treatment plant. And because there's 14 and because there's some variability between them, we track like a cost per million gallons treated. So there actually is numbers that we, we track and look at. Um, a lot of it has to be with the size of the plant or whether they're doing nitrogen removal or whether they have, you know, uh, dewatering facilities. So it does this vary quite a bit. So Wards Island, do you know, like, a, how much it costs there? Yeah, I do, but I don't have the number in my head right now. Okay, I share with us. But, you know, I could probably wake somebody up and ask them. <laughs> I'll do that. But, I, but uh, that we do have that kind of information, and that really informs us in terms of where we want to make the best investments for long-term planning. Thank you. Um, so that's a good point that for that type of question, you can email us um, and we will get back to you. I'm going to pull up the email address, but it's ltcp at dep.nyc.gov and we can follow back up with you. Um, any other questions? Uh, yes, gentlemen in the sweater. Uh, yeah, what kind of preparations for uh, what 
Um, so Jim, I think you touched on this a little bit. Can you elaborate? Is this on? Yeah. Uh, no, it's a great question. So sea level rise is obviously a, a long-term <laughs> condition, not only this area, but nationally and internationally, folks are going to be dealing with and resiliency in terms of the larger storms. So, you know, that toolbox, and I don't want to go back to the toolbox, but when we look at those solutions, particularly when we're looking at larger scale solutions like storage tunnels or storage tanks, we're trying to make them have as much utility as possible to work and maybe add to resiliency in neighborhoods uh, that might be older or help with sea level rise over time. So we do factor it into our decision making matrix when we're looking at this, you know, when there's a synergy between water quality and some of these bigger solutions and then broader benefits to those, those areas. Citywide as well, I don't think it's, um, I think it's, you know, there's projects that are looking at resiliency in Manhattan, resiliency in, in some of the outer boroughs as well, that aren't necessarily linked to our infrastructure alone, but like, you know, barriers and those type of things, those continually for Jamaica Bay, for neighborhood specific, um, those are continually being looked at as well, by the state as well as the city. Um, so there's a lot of different, there's a, there's a resiliency and climate change toolbox that goes well beyond what we're, what we're looking in here. We do try to factor it into the investments we make. Hopefully that made some sense. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, first, just wanted to thank you all for all the information you shared tonight. This is my first time attending one of these meetings, and I found it very informative. Um, question is mainly for Angela. Uh, the number that stuck out to me the most on your conversation about rates and the finances uh, was the, about $1,000 a year is what somebody pays for their water and sewer bill. Um, that's about the price of a brand new iPhone. I know this because I was looking for Black Friday deals and could not find one. Um, so this is probably a debate for another room, but I would say that that is um, that money is more valuable in terms of providing water and sewer for any person for the course of a year versus being spent on an iPhone. I think. Most of the people in this room would probably agree with that, given that we're passionate about water. It's probably why we're here. Um, so with that in mind, I'm curious what sort of programs DEP is doing uh, in terms of public outreach specifically related to rate cases um, in order to get more funding for all the things that we're, we're talking about today. Um, I know there's a lot of conversation about how many people are in this room, and I think that's great, but relative uh, in New York City, there's, there's not a whole lot of people here, and we're probably not reaching the majority of people that we need to reach. Um, so I'm just curious if DP has any sort of initiatives uh, to get that word out to more people. Yeah, um, I mean, thank you for making that point, because um, we obviously share your enthusiasm, and um, we certainly value the importance of water and making these investments. Um, I mean, we love building things. I mean, we're usually being curbed in terms of how much we could possibly um, put through in our capital program any given year. We are probably the second largest capital program in the city of New York, maybe next to the schools. Um, uh, certainly DDC, Ana Barrio was uh, previously there and um, knows that that's a very big capital program too. So a lot of what we curb in, t in terms of our enthusiasm for building a bigger capital program is that you actually have to be able to deliver those projects and push those projects through the system. But to your point in terms of the value of water, I, c I could not agree more. We participate in a lot of national campaigns um, emphasizing the value of water. We think it's very um, undervalued and certainly uh, believe that there are these types of programs that happen nationwide that um, imagine a day without water. You know, what, what would that mean in your daily life? What would that mean to our economy? And so I've seen those sorts of things at the, at the national level. Um, Mikhail, do you want to expand on anything that's coming out of public affairs in terms of the um, rate setting process? Because I think that's what probably hits us most at the local level. Sure. So um, every year we have a, a series of water rate hearings um, when it comes time to set the new rate. Um, and we partner very closely with 
neighborhoods, community boards, elected officials to execute those meetings. Um, in terms of the attendance, it has varied greatly depending on what the expected rate increase is, right? And so um, we tend to get a lot of people when there's been um, a suggestion for a very high rate increase, right? Um, and then, you know, for the, I think the past two years, there was no rate increase, and so we, we sort of saw very little attendance at those meetings. Um, but we do try to get the word out um, in terms of sort of general awareness and understanding about um, drinking New York City tap water and how much less expensive it is to drink New York City tap water than it is to buy um, a, you know, plastic bottle of water. Um, we are planning a series of new um, behavior change media campaigns related to drinking New York City tap water. We see that as an opportunity to not only um, promote sort of health and wellness and um, the sort of amazing quality of New York City tap water, but also to educate and inform people in sort of a different way about the cost. But that was a great question, thank you. Um, Rob, yeah. So I just I want to go back to one slide that Jim showed early on, um, and uh, another thing that, that Keith showed. But in Jim's slide, um, it showed uh, which it, slide? It, Let it, me it was a, a it was a bunch of blue bars that showed attainment mm -hmm. in different tributaries, and it, it said that the Gowanus had a ninety five percent attainment rate or something. When the public sees that, their interpretation is that. That means that 95% of the time, the Gowanus is swimmable. Keith showed a slide, and there it is. So those are blue bars, and it looks really great. You're like at 100% all the way across. And then there are those annoying orange bars, which don't look as good. So that raises, why are you guys relying on this outdated standard that doesn't really mean anything to the public, when really the, the orange bars are much more widely understood, and really a better picture? Of what's going on. I mean, would you, Jim, swim in the Gowanus? It's got a 95 or 100 percent rate there. Would you do it? Would you have your kids swim in it? I mean, that's what that's what that says. You wouldn't do that, right? And I, I just, I think you guys, the LTPC is is aimed at the state and getting the state to say okay to your plans, but it's also more than ever something that the public has to follow and understand. And I think you got to go away from that kind of messaging because it's it's. It's off, and the same thing goes with this geometric mean thing. If you're going to use that, you got to explain really what that means. Thirty day, or, you know, that thirty day thing. That doesn't really a person who's using the water doesn't care about geometric means. It it just doesn't it doesn't compute. And you're trying to do two things with this document, and I think you really got to think about how the public is going to. Do you just understand it? That, that's a completely fair comment. This is based on geo means, as you're pointing out. So this isn't meant to be all the time. It's meant to be 100% attainment with the geo mean. Right? But attainment to you means something different than to the public. Understood. So again, you're making a really good point. Nar extensively talked about water body advisories. So we don't just our public messaging is not this. We put out water body advisories when we get those rainfalls, and we put it out citywide. And we're trying to refine that. We're spending, you know, Pinar is working very closely with Keith and all of our staff. We all collaborate very well. Uh, so that's one key piece of it is trying to get the word out when it does rain. Hey, you don't want to go out there. You know, and, and if the, the duration of the advisory varies depending on the water body. Yeah, right? No, I get it, I get it. So, so it's more, it's not, this isn't meant to be just the only snapshot. It is the GeoMean is the standard that we, that we compare to. Bear with me. I, I understand your question, and you are making a fair point. I'm trying to answer it. Yeah. The water body advisors are a key part of this as well. And again, we're trying to continually refine our message. And even this comment, you know, in terms of future public meetings, we can try to integrate this a little bit better, that it's not just this and then separate it. But it, it is more complicated than just this. We recognize that. It, it, it's a very good point. Okay, I just, I think, um, we talked about this, Peter and I did, that it's, compliance is, is an important thing. And, and um, I would salute you for moving towards it. but. It's really only half, half of it, 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 it. The public wants to use the harbor, and it, whether you want that role or not, it's it's sort of falling on you, and and you, that's that's a huge part of it. So, I think the notification slide should precede this and be bigger than this slide, really. And, you know. and, and I'm an enthusiast too. Of the water body, it's a very fair comment. Thank you.
And I, I think it sort of um, clarifies kind of why we've had these public, these parallel public engagement processes. So obviously you've participated in the stakeholder meetings that we've had on the water body advisories, um, all of the different things that we're trying to do because we understand that this LTCP program, it, it shouldn't happen in a vacuum, right? There's, yes, our, um, we want to share this information, not only because we are committed to do so as part of the public participation for the LTCP, but also engage with folks who can't make it out to this meeting tonight, and also all of the folks that use the water bodies and want to have more um, information sort of at their fingertips. So I wholeheartedly agree with you, and I think that's why we've really been pushing to have not only public engagement, but um, sort of technical opportunities beyond just the LTCP. And also why we presented this here tonight, because I actually think this is the first time we've presented on our advisories program and we at this meeting, but we do see the need to integrate those stories better. Um, yeah, Larry. Thanks, um, just picking, up, picking up on that and then transitioning back to another point. The, it's definitely true that there are different audiences for different things and communicating things in different ways, but I think there is a problem if, go back to your question, would you swim in that water, right? If, if, if the answer is no, and yet the answer to do you think you're in compliance is yes, then that sort of begs the question of are you computing compliance in the right way? Uh, and Because it becomes sort of a game of statistical <laughs> manipulation can we call this compliance? And I think there really needs to be a discussion, an honest and open discussion about what compliance means. Uh, and, and there shouldn't be such a divergence between what compliance means in the legal and regulatory context between the city and the state and what it's safe to swim in the water means when you're talking to a person on the street. Right? Uh, and that's, so that, there's a, that, that's a sort of an underlying problem that's, I think, uh, uh, cuts across this the whole exercise, not just a communications problem. Um, to, to, the, um, uh, to the, your presentation, Mikkel, I appreciate your kind of getting into some more detail about the, uh, the citywide public participation process for that last LTCP. Um, I, I think we're, you're still gonna keep hearing from us that there's a big difference between a summary document and seeing the full plan. <coughs> Summary documents super valuable for people who don't want to read the full plan, um, right? But there are people who do, and that have, and people who are, frankly, paid to do that on behalf of their constituents, right? Who are the rate payers of DEP, right? And and when there's not an opportunity to review that, it's not it's not sufficient public participation. If you look at any other context, where you've got multi-billion dollar projects being proposed or not proposed, um, there's an EIS for it, right? I understand there's not gonna be an EIS here because this fits into a neat little box of being an enforcement proceeding, right? But to imagine in some other context, you would go through this whole exercise of all this study, of all this analysis, proposing an alternative with a 500 page report, and nobody gets to see the report and comment on it before it gets finalized, uh, and, and that's called adequate public participation, it's just so anomalous to anything else about the way major decisions get made in this day and age after we've been through decades of understanding the need for public engagement in government decision making. So that it's just, it's, there's still a major, frankly, a major disconnect there as well, and it's really hard to, Really hard to fathom when DEP continues to ask for more and more time to do these reports while there still is not enough time to do what anybody would do in any other situation that's analogous and provide a report with the technical details for scrutiny. Um, so I think to the first part of your comment, um, Angela, did you want to respond to that in terms of the um, compliance and uses piece? I don't think it was a question, I heard Larry's point. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Larry, there wasn't a question, right? I, I understood what you said, but that was the statement. <laughs> right? Fair enough. Okay. Yeah, yeah, 
response? I'd be curious. A difference of opinion, but it was a statement. Uh, well, I mean, the Gowanus Canal specifically, I wouldn't be swimming in, um, in spite of any of the, that's just a one point um, in terms of decision making about the appropriateness of that water body for um, and suitability for swimming. It's currently a super fun site. It's got a lot of manufactured gas plant material. I mean, it, it really does need to be remediated. So no swimming in the Gowanus Canal if, if folks can help it. I mean, if they're kayaking and there's contact, I think, you know, proper hygiene is beneficial, but I don't think that some of these water bodies can be measured by the compliance with the water quality standard alone. So I think that's a larger discussion that we should have and potentially improve on education about some of the other risks in these water bodies. Um, and then I, I think to, to the point about the public participation, um, I mean, obviously, I, I disagree with the characterization that we are allergic to engaging with the public. That's something that we do quite regularly. Um, many of you, we talk with all the time. Um, and we are, however, sort of limited in terms of the time that we have to execute these LTCPs. And that's always been a challenge from the time that we started in, in 2012. Um, and the original framework for that public participation plan, yes, it did say that um, the state and the city would sort of have these discussions regarding the LTCP before the public knew the final recommended plan. Um, and we recognize that there is a lot of concern with that because people want to know what are you actually proposing. And so while I understand that um, your position is that we are not going far enough. I do hope that you can appreciate the fact that we are much farther than we were four years ago in the fact that we can actually say, here is what our final recommendation will be, or is rather, here's our final recommendation, here are the costs, here are the schedules for it. You will have two separate 30-day response to comments. That's something that we have not done in the past. And so I, I understand that you don't see it as a, as a compromise, but it really is our best attempt to have robust engagement where we can while still meeting an appropriate milestone. Because as you are all aware, the original due date for this LTCP was December 2017. And so due to delays, challenges, the complexity of this LTCP, we are really not looking to extend that process any further, but while still trying to manage um, and have as much robust participation as we can. Yeah, but I, mean, I, I do want to acknowledge the work that you've done, especially with Hal, and, and to thank you for as far as DP has come in those, in those years. It definitely has been meaningful improvement. It's, to be blunt, it started from a low bar. Yeah. And the fact that it's gotten to where it's gotten doesn't mean it is has gotten to where it ought to be, uh, or, or to anything that meets the accepted norms in any other context. Understood. Um, yes. Yeah, so we're gonna we're actually about thirty minutes over time. So I, I do want to do a, a soft release if people need to go. Um, but before I do that, um, and then we can certainly stick around and, and answer questions. Um, I do want to just thank all of the DEP staff that participated in putting this together tonight. Um, I especially want to give um, a, a round of our applause to our senior leadership. It takes a lot of work to condense a year's worth of work, 10 years worth of work, into sort of a two, now two and a half hour um, presentation. But, um, really, our senior leadership has been so committed not only to improving water quality, but also this public participation piece. Um, so I want to thank them. I want to thank their staff that helped with putting all of this information together. Um, and then lastly, I really do want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. We know that there's still a lot of work to be done, not only in the water, but also on this public participation side. We hope that you'll continue to dialogue with us as we continue to improve. Um, and just on that note, I do want to give a quick plug. If you loved coming to this meeting tonight, and you love coming to any of our other 
um, public engagement meetings. I am hiring for a community coordinator. Um, that person will be working for me, but will be essentially working on public engagement programming for Pam and Angela's teams. So they'll be focused specifically on the Bureau of Sustainability and the Bureau of Wastewater Treatment and a lot of robust um, working to make our public engagement more robust on that side. So if you are interested, check out nyc.gov slash jobs. Um, so with that, I will say good night, but if there are any questions, we're um, happy to stick around. So thank you.